a long time for me to realize that this is the only possible way to hear more an hour long talk and implicitly life working, which is still to have any relevance to me. Um, so this is one repeated moment in, in a variety of wake up calls for me that, that we needed to figure out how to listen to the public better and engage the public. And um, see, I didn't do it with you. <laughs> Uh, I'm thinking about signs, names, and kitchens. And the other thing that happened about this time is that in my lab, I still happen to have some great natural historians who started to make discoveries right around Raleigh and in backyards. And this is Benoit Guinard. And my favorite discovery Benoit ever made was that he was really sad in the, in the sort of holiday winter season because he'd broken up with his girlfriend. And so he did the thing that Benoit does when he's sad. He went out to collect ants <laughs> in the snow. and he then took pictures of them but didn't collect them, collect them, and included this ant, which he put a picture of this online and then just left it there and he felt better and then he met another girl. Um, but, but then somebody else looked at this and realized this was an ant that was not supposed to exist. It's only been collected one time ever. Um, and people thought that maybe it was a fake. It's, he collect, Benoit collected it on a sidewalk in Cary. We've never seen it again. But it suggested there was cool stuff right where we live. Another example of this Asian needle ant, which we didn't know lived in North Carolina, but we found it behind our building. Turns out to be one of the most common ants around here. Turns out to be pretty cool. It, uh, instead of laying a recruitment trail when it finds food, it goes and grabs its sisters and then drags their sisters and throws them on the food. <laughs> and then they go back and drag more sisters. And so this was cool stuff we were seeing in town. And then a student showed up in the lab, a high school student said she wanted to work on tigers, which is an artifact of us being in the zoology program. Um, and we didn't have tigers, and so I lied and said this was a tiger ant. <laughs> and, uh, which is just a picture behind it, right? Um, but nobody ever collected this ant alive, and so it seemed like an ambitious thing to start with. But I said, Catherine, go out and find this. Um, and she found it alive behind our building. There's Catherine with a poster on this ant. Um, and she graduated not too long ago, and I asked, what do you want to do, Catherine? And she still wants to work on tigers, which is <laughs> something of a sadness. But there was a realization as we were doing this that we, a lot of what we were doing in our backyards that we could engage the public in. Um, and so this is work we were doing in Broadway Media. This is my front friend, Jim Denoff Berg. And here, here he is in this New York Times article. And here's somebody studying him, studying against the media. And so it seemed like something was wrong with his system. And we could eliminate the middleman, I mean, not in some existential way, but just research-wise. Uh, and we can involve kids in doing a lot of this work. And so the first thing we ever did with citizen science was School of Ants. We made these kits. We offered to send them out. In the first week, we got tens of thousands of requests for kits. And so then we said, kids, why don't you build your own kits? And so we started this project called School of Ants, where kids could uh, put out baits to collect ants in their backyards and then send them to us. We'd have experts ID them. And this was really our first citizen science project. This is where a kid in Wisconsin and a kid in Washington find that Asian needle ant and extend its range by 2,000 miles. And so it was a cool start to that project, which then spread to Australia. It spread to Italy. We're now doing it in Denmark. In Australia, they get these cool t-shirts. <laughs> uh, we don't do the t-shirts, but um, with the Cal Academy is now doing this in Peru. And what's neat is this is the kind of project that we build on for a long time. And so Tyler Gatone is a grad student at the University of Florida, or was, and he was able to take specimens that kids took to look at the evolution of the common pavement ant, where it might have come from, what sort of natural selection it was under. And he did that all based on samples from kids. Another graduate student I've never ever met is now studying winter ant evolution. This is this common ant here that stores honey in its butt for its sisters in the middle of winter. I've got a cousin like that. <laughs> but Maria, I don't even know how to pronounce Maria's last name because I've never met her, is now working with the specimens the kids collected in order to look at the evolution of this ant. It's the same kind of thing we build on this over time. And this led us to lots of projects with Holly Manager, uh, co-leading this stuff, and many different things. And then led to the sense that maybe we could start to do some education in light of this. Because what we were doing was really engaging the public and doing science, and there was no formal education piece. 
And there are two sort of moments in this story for me personally, one of which I was working on this book and thinking about the history of science and thinking a lot about this guy, Galen. And Galen did all sorts of amazing work very early in the history of science. He died in about 130 AD. And he made tons of discoveries. Much of what we think of as, as known in medicine comes from him. And so he's a pretty cool guy. But then the Visigoths with their shiny belt buckles, which should um, seem apropos at the moment, come storming over the hill. And for a thousand years, there's essentially no advance in anatomy. And so artists talk, have done away with the term the Dark Ages. They don't like the term the Dark Ages because for art, other art happens. From the perspective of science, nothing happened. And so it really was a Dark Ages until the early Renaissance when people start to do dissections again. Anatomy is where a lot of this first takes place. Not just the dissections, but the next steps in, in the history. And so when that happens, what they do is they read from Galen, which is what the guy up top is doing. And then one person dissects the body. Another guy explains to the students what they're supposed to see based on what Galen had shown. And so the entire endeavor is not meant to find anything new. It's meant to show what Galen had already shown a thousand years ago. And so this lasts for a really long time until this guy Here's a guy. This guy, Vesalius, starts to actually pay attention to the body and make new discoveries. And so this is the birth of the Renaissance in terms of, of science. And from here, new discoveries start to be made. The idea that we can figure out new things is a possibility. And this is an amazing moment. But as I was writing about these stories and thinking about them, one of the things that was conspicuous was that this rebirth was partial. Because the truth is, when we talk about education, we mostly still do education like this, except for graduate students. Right? We have a cat, we put the cat out, and the students look for what we already know. And so this has been on my mind for a while. When a group of people who had already gotten together, Jason Painter with the Science House, the Friday Institute, the Kinn Fellows, and started talking about a grant where, where they would do something new with bringing science to classrooms. Could it be citizen science? And so this was this really amazing moment because it, it sort of fit with what, what I was feeling like we needed, and there was this amazing group who was already together, and then pulled together the basis of a grant in which what could be done and this is me, I was late to the party. Um, <laughs> it's like a fun party. And so what would be then done in this project, is, which is what mostly has happened um, already, is that at the Museum of Natural Sciences, teachers and postdocs would come together to co-create lesson plans around citizen science projects. And so this is science that's involving participants that are non-scientists, but are a part of the scientific process. Those teachers then test the lessons in their classrooms, and the, there's evaluation. The lessons go online. Lessons spread to other classes. Data accumulate. Scientists do science with the classes and the basis of the data. And then there are summer programs built around these lessons. <clears throat> it turns out none of this is super easy. And there's been some crying, and not just me, other people. Um, but that we've gotten this to work. And so now we have lesson plans. And the goal is to get the 10,000 teachers in classes, and we're at 600 teachers so far. And so we have a long way to go, but we're in this growth phase of the project because now we know how to do these things. And so this is just an example group of the teachers who came together to do the science with the postdocs, um, and, and postdocs in that picture too. And the kinds of projects that were set up in, this, in these summer endeavors between the postdocs and the teachers were a project on, on e-mammal camera trapping, where you could blow in a, a camera trap. And Stephanie here can talk more about this later if you're interested. Um, and so we can document the, the, where mammals are, what's going on. We can do it locally. We can do it nationally. But we can also do it globally. And so like my daughter's school is, has a camera trap right now, and is very interested to learn that they mostly have a squirrel butt that, that drops down in front of the camera trap every day but they know that there's a school in India with a tiger. And so that's told them something about their world. Um, 
they, they might be on the ass end of things, but it's less than totally clear. <laughs> Um, then there's ant picnic and, and versions thereof where kids can work with ants. Um, and then shark tooth forensics and now a new paleontology program as well where kids can find new shark species based on these shark fossils you see all over North Carolina every time you go with your kid to dig somewhere. And then a project on the key microbes and dandelion roots and the extent to which those microbes facilitate the ability of dandelions to to live special places, are the dandelions recruiting their own special microbes? They appear to be. Um, and so these have been really neat, and they're all the lessons from these are all online now already, and you can find them at Students Discover. And they're all adjusted to standards. In addition, we're doing we're generating products: so new science, formal education, teacher student engagement, digital content, and then books. We have these books about ants of, of different parts of the U.S. based on data kids have collected. Books about spiders, same kind of thing. Books about household animals. This amazing set of comic books that Andrew Collins developed based on what was going on with the citizen science. And, and so this is where we are. This is sort of looking backwards. And already in this context, there are four main ways you can be involved. One is that we, we would love participation in these summer programs, these summer bridge programs, in Wake and Alamance counties right now and in Pender in the future. And, and this is where we're bringing kids together to learn all in the context of citizen science. There's plenty of opportunity to work with postdocs and teachers on existing product, projects. So if you want to add to eMAML, if you want to build on eMAML, for example, there are lots of ways to do that. Um, there's lots of opportunity to collaborate to improve the impact of lessons. And frankly, if you want to look at any of the data from any of these projects and work with us in any context, that's possible. Um, and then there's lots of opportunity to collaborate on in interfaces. But I'm going to walk through to what the next step has been, which is really sort of going from where we were. Um, yeah, it's you, Karen. <laughs> So Karen Cooper's in the middle and there. Don't be confused by the dual presence. Um, so a key next step for us has been to go from this framework where we have teachers and postdocs working at a museum to add to that a framework where we can partner with any citizen science project around the world. And so two weeks ago, we sent kind of a scary email to 1,500 citizen science projects all around the world and said, look, if you get your project info to us in a standardized way, we'll work with you to develop a lesson plan. Will then serve and give the teachers. The response has been um, amazing. And so, between when I came in this morning and when I got here, five new projects have written to say they want to work with us on lesson plans. And this is going to work in part because we're working with Karen and Darlene Cavalier. I don't know if we said Darlene's last name. Cavalier. Um, and SciStarter, which is going to be, with SciStarter is the biggest online hub for citizen science projects. So you can go through SciStarter to get to our projects, to see where your teachers can be involved, where people you know can work on these things. And I'm just going to quickly show you one of these so you see what they look like. So this is the new kind of lesson plan we're developing. They're really simple. We're working with BuzzHoot Roar to do these schematics that show that some basic function of what's going on in the lesson plan. Um, you can then see what grade level they work for, how long they take, what the basic topic area is. You can see about the lesson, download the key things, and then a really simple setup visually to see what you do. So you catch a cicada, you know where it's from, you do some basic measurements, you note these things in the paper, and you send it in. And there's a materials list, mailing info, basic info on cicadas, and then that, the sort of sciencey part of what's this project about? What are we trying to figure out? More about that, about Deanna who leads this project. And then there are lots of opportunities for extension and then where this fits in the standards. And so we hope within a year to have these for 200 citizen science projects around the world. Um, and to do it in different languages. And so right now we're working in Danish, Spanish, Italian, and as of this morning, Swedish. Not for all projects, but for projects that are relevant to particular places. 
So then I'm going to finish up talking and then we. Um, general discussion. Um, and so with these new projects, these are all just, you know, as they come online, waiting to be used. Um, we'd love to hear projects that you've worked with that you think, oh, you guys have to work with this group, and they might not contact you. If you know teachers who really are working on some project they love, let us know. Um, the other thing is that there are lots of graduate student programs that go out to classrooms and don't always have great materials with them. So the Cal Academy is now building kits to take into classrooms around California and Nevada. And we're gonna work with them to make kits for the Southeast as well. But you can also develop kits that are based on citizen science lesson plans that you just take into classrooms. And so everything is ready made to work. Um, and then if there are projects that you want to do, that you wanna develop lessons about, we're ready to work with people to do that. And depending on timelines and how ambitious they are, how we would work with you would be different. Um, the other part, though, that we're starting to think about is how do we bring this to the university? Because the truth is most of what we're doing in university classes is still missing that key piece. And for me personally, one of the wake-up calls for this was really early in my career, and I've um, not been able to act on it, which is that when we were doing this work in New York, we took all the entering freshmen um, for Barnard College uh, and Columbia across Manhattan to sample ants and plants. And when we did, in one day of work, we found that the most common ant species in Manhattan was not known to be present in the US. And it suggested to me that we could take a whole university first year group and do real science that then got built on through time. That's proven really difficult at a, at a much bigger university. That's the ant. But what we have seen is that as we get lesson plans online, other people use them, even if we don't. And so this year, Vassar's entire freshman class is going to use some of our lesson plans. And so what we're trying to do is think about, well, how do we just keep getting things online with the idea that if we build these resources, people will start to use them and maybe we can get a more general approach to these. Um, and so these are folks working with us to develop labs which are really like lesson plans um, for university classrooms um, with the idea we can build a series of these around which introductory classes can be built. Amanda Hale, I couldn't find any pictures of you, Amanda, and so it seemed like a forensic pig. It was research appropriate anyway. <laughs> um, and so Amanda's going to be leading a lot of this work this summer. Bucky's thinking about it for classes this fall, as, as is Jim Landon. Um, and we're working on a grant with Karen Cooper to think about could we actually build a whole textbook for intro classes around these kinds of lessons. And so we'd be delighted if people have things that they really think would work in the classes they're doing that relate to citizen science. The other thing we're doing to try to make that easier is we're working with people to do data interfaces. And so CODAP um, is a group that develops interfaces for abundance data, a standard ecological data. So we can map data, interact with data in a way that works both in the K-12 and the university context. Holly Vick leads a project called Finch. Um, it allows us to engage really complicated microbial data in a way that can work in the classroom. And Carlos Galler is here, has worked a lot with these data, and we're, Holly is now investing more in figuring out how to make these more useful for a classroom with us. And so Julia Stevens, or Julia? So Julia, um, it's going to work with Holly a lot on this. Um, and then we're also thinking about how do we build frameworks for students of all ages to get hypotheses back to us when you have some cool new idea that we're missing. Um, and we're super interested in partnerships that would help to do that. What do I hope for for this? One of the things personally I've been really interested in is figuring out as we discover these species with kids in backyards where people live, can we also show the value of these species? And so a big part of what my lab is going to be focused on in the next year is just finding the value in these everyday species. Not to say they have to have a value, but we need to better do a better job of showing what those can be. But the other thing that I hope for ultimately is a systematic revision of science and education to a model where in K-12 we start kids doing science as part of citizen science projects. When their first year of college, these projects expand, where in subsequent years, later students build 
on what younger students have done, where we teach all students how to discover what is unknown rather than how to memorize what is known. I know I wrote that late, because late at night I used too many comments. Um, with all of this being embedded in the humanities and social sciences, which is the context in which it makes sense, um, with all of this being facilitated by the public science cluster that we have at NC State, where we've hired Karen Cooper as joint between forestry and the Museum of Natural Sciences, which is the biggest coup we could possibly imagine um, in terms of jump-starting what we do in a great way. Gene Goodwin has recently been hired in communication, who is going to help to develop common courses or build on common frameworks across the university to train graduate students in engaging the public. And then we have three more hires. And so I'm going to close here with an invitation to join us in doing this work. Um, and to join us in any way that you're interested. And you don't have to join us today. But if you see, as time goes on, ways that you can build on what we've done, ways that you can move beyond what we've done to next steps, that we're a big group of folks, many of them are in this room. <laughs> And I think we have the capacity to do something really great, but especially if we can leverage what's happening all over campus. And so I'll close there, and maybe we can uh, talk some, but then also people can meet each other. Um, if, you, if you're involved in this project, you just raise your hands so people can see you and bother you after. Yeah, all right, so you, you saw it and bother. Um, so, so, so questions, thoughts? Yeah. I have a quick sort of follow-up on that. Um, my name is Chris Boggs. I'm a doctoral student engineer. Um, one of the questions I have, if you look at that, that picture of your colleague in the meeting capturing things, so he's using a solo cup to capture those images, right? Is there any interest in developing additional like, tools and sensors to be able to capture that information and then put that in a kind of collaborative sense? Yeah, absolutely. Um, at 300. I don't know. 100 is a high percent, like 300. Yeah. Um, <laughs> And so there have been some amazing projects in that vein, and I think and that's not been the kind of project we've done this historically, but it, it's, it's in part because of the, the specific partners we have, and we would love to see more. And there are people in the world that are building on some of this. And so there was a great project in Copenhagen for a while with sensors on flights, mm -hmm. picking up um, air pollution data around the city. Yeah. Um, well, there's, there's also another great example, like you can basically take two razors, a piece of foam board, and a cell phone to make a UV spectrometer out of that, and then be able to analyze different light spectrum using colorometer. Yeah, and so I mean, the question is then the mechanism for how do you get these new tools in, in the pipeline and start developing that too? So I'm sure we can. So that, that part we're okay at. The okay. first part of knowing that that exists as a possibility, I, I personally didn't, right? And so that, yeah, it would be amazing. Yeah, tell me your name again. It's Chris Box. Chris Box. And you? I thought. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so we get so what we've covered so far is really uh, circumscribed by who we started with, which has been great. But there are many more dimensions that we could cover um, that we haven't. And it'd be, I mean, this is a great one. I mean, sensor stuff. Um, and I, when we talked about a project at one point about um, I play here, where kids are, are measuring their own environment where they play. Um, and then that those data are then used to inform how we think about managing those environments, and, and so that'd be amazing. Uh, you know, that, that, the other thing that was like looking at that gap and developing the tool to get that. And that's the thing that's the kind of the space to work together. In this room. I'm a doctoral student. I have no way to speak this, so um, you have no way to talk to you. <laughs> <laughs>
I don't know, maybe this is a question for later, but perhaps Karen wants to jump in about those projects that we're reaching out to, like the computer project, are those largely uh, bio, eco, environmental type projects, or are there some other? There's a myth. Karen, go ahead. Yeah, I mean, I think it Yeah, so that we, we do have online already, where did they go? And so what, which humanities projects will be up online right now? Culture of the field that has a biological slash monitoring uh, globally um, tilt, but it doesn't need to be. And I, I think that there are lots of kinds of projects, maybe especially at the interface of biology and monitoring and other fields that are really rich. We were talking some about a sourdough project where we don't understand the kinetics of sourdough very well, which would require I mean, some interesting physics and interesting biology. But, but I mean, I do think that, and one of the things that's great to me about doing this kind of work here is it very much overlaps with at least the historic version of the land grant mission, where you're engaging stakeholders, providing new content to stakeholders, getting feedback from stakeholders, and contextualizing the feedback you've been given. And that's where the land grant starts, which seems like it's actually very similar to what this endeavor is. And so especially if we can build on that history, which has a strong engineering piece, a strong agricultural piece, we can do things that are not obvious to the rest of the field. Yeah, I was just wondering, I know in the early process, when you were, the teacher made lesson plans and brought them to the classroom, they were evaluated and then tweaked, right? And I was just wondering about how much they took the work and there was conversation. How much detail um, I guess there are multiple answers there. Uh, I think ta time ends up being a really key feature in the classroom or contingent on classrooms. And so really long lessons are hard unless you really have figured out exactly how they overlap with what you have to already do. So we hear time constraints and things, but that's not super surprising. Um, trying to think, I mean, we have a whole write-up on this stuff that I can send you. And I guess the other answer would be um, that it's very contingent on the class and the resources of the class. And, and so there's some discussion of the ideal scenario being where you have some lessons that would work in a West African classroom where you have cell phones, but not necessarily electricity in the classroom. And some lessons that work at the School of Math and Science in Durham, where you have all the resources you could imagine. Um, and so, some clearly, th there is an indication that if you can find partners at universities, and Jason can speak to this, that that re really is a helpful thing. Um, and so if these spread, and then we reconnect to universities and local places, that that's a really powerful resource. Jason, do you agree with that? Yeah, definitely. Well, teachers and students are two main weapons. So the more that you can connect with researchers, museum people, other people in their area, I think that's Julia? I just want to build on that a little bit. In my experience, um, I've been working with a teachers in that it's really important that it's clear 
what can, what can be cut out <laughs> because it's not just the difference between schools, it's the differences between individual classes, but by even by the same teacher in the same year or year to year, they have a lot of variation between the students that they're working with. And so, you know, my teachers went into culture four different types of microbes this year that was like the plan. One of the other one of the teachers was like, you just can't do this one. It's too much for these kids to handle. And so they just did it, you know, it's fine. Um, she's like, we're gonna save it for the end of the year because maybe that's no way that the class gets into the same time. Um, so there, to, to allow for that flexibility within the lesson plan is really important. Um, just yeah, from, from one class to the next to the same Hi, yes, we're um, a nonprofit provider. Associated with the university, but we actually just have a tool that we would be interested in sharing. And what this it, it's called Tree Tagger, and so you can just use your phone to go out and you can take pictures um, in Twitter. And so you can get the picture, the geolocation, and provide some textual information about what you're looking at. If you're interested in forestry. This what this conversation is making me think is that this could be used in the classroom for um, to bring technology up and sort of already you know, you're doing a lesson plans on trees or anything like that, but then also add the capacity of um, having uh, competitions between schools, and so you can have even a broader gathering of that kind of data. And so this has the capacity to do that, to have um, the school gathers this many tags, and you know, this many such information, and see if you can any the school do this. So I don't know if that just making me think about how you could add a game component to also increase the interest by children or something. Yeah, I mean, there, you can't see behind you, but there are a lot of happily nodding heads. <laughs> um, just getting back to um, what you mentioned about the language and education. Have we done any work with 4-H? I realize that's not um, an organized, it's an organized structure, it's not classes. But it's affiliated with schools, and I can see that the kids excited in 4-H about this. They're going to go to those schools. They're going to talk about it. And it would be a way to start bringing those young people up, expecting that to be. Yeah, so I think we weren't ready until now, but now I actually feel like we're ready to pull together packets for something like 4-H, and for those to then um, be part of what's happening there. And so. I guess that's the other thing I would say is that we've, we've rounded a corner in the project and now is a time when if, if somebody from 4-H wants to, to start to build on this and bring this to what they're doing, we're now ready. Um, and of course, we'll be more ready in 10 years and in 20 years, we'll be super ready. But we're, I, think, I feel like um, now is a great moment for that. And so we, we've had some modest conversations, but now will be the time. Yeah. Now you say it's the time, it reminded me something. It's actually also from the sensor side, it's the time because uh, the maker movement uh, for the last couple of years and the uh, Internet of Things exploding now, there are more and more uh, electronic devices available where you can buy things uh, for a couple of dollars and start uh, simple programming and etc. So there is a great opportunity here to combine these two things, uh, uh, collecting data maybe doing some simple analysis uh, right there instead of sending some. So this brings me to a question. Let me look at this uh, traditional template of performing research. You start with the hypothesis, you design your experiments, you perform those experiments, and you analyze your data, and you revise your hypothesis, right? So in this uh, template, uh, then you need a workforce, for example, collecting 10 samples. Uh, it's a great opportunity to ask to the general public and get them involved. But uh, my understanding here is we'd like to get everyone involved in all the stages, right? So in this uh, big picture, uh, where is the role of the scientist and postdoc? Designing the entire process, 
or you get the uh, citizen scientist to design that type of data. So I, I guess um, I'll offer my personal answer, and then I'll offer what I think is the answer of the field, and then I would, I would hypothesize that people in the room differ in the answer. <laughs> so I find it most pleasing when the when people engaged in this science can really see the whole process. And so as an example project like this, we have this camel cricket project, which I really like, where the, the first phase was we knew like nothing about the camel crickets. So we asked people, do you have them? It generated the distribution data. We had a hypothesis about what explained that, those data. We asked for a new kind of data, totally rejected that hypothesis. And, and then we built in that way. And so it was this step-by-step -step kind of uh, effort. I would say that the field overall includes some of that, but then also includes projects that are more like monitoring. And then things, uh, you know, at different steps, you have hypothesis-driven things embedded in the monitoring. One of the things we were thinking about, and then we've done a really poor job of, is when you go from that monitoring to the hypothesis-driven part, how do you re-engage the students, the teachers, so they see that part too? And like Karen has an amazing paper showing that what proportion of our data that we use to understand birds and climate change come from citizen science? 50%. Um, but almost nobody participating in those projects knows that. Is that fair to say? Um, and so how do we get back, get that back so that people have seen something that might happen five years later, which is another challenge in, in this stuff. And we've, We've done a lot of sequencing based projects and they're slow. And so people send in their kit and then the next day ask, well, what's the result? <laughs> oh, we don't, it might be a year. And it turned out it's more like two years. Um, and so I think there's, you know, that's the, there is this other part that I think is really important. But I think that the field, and as much as we're trying to help all these different projects, there's going to be a range of answers to that question. Um, is that, Anybody have divergent views about that? Karen, would you? I just want to say the science house is what works here. A lot of the stuff you don't want to work on, um, we, can, we can connect you with, with schools and teachers, we can help you with the lesson plans, and uh, that sort of outreach piece, that's what we're good at. So um, I know a lot of you will want to be engaged to a certain level, but I also understand you've got research. So we can help more formalize, get it out, and get it out across the state. I think that's the biggest misconception of science. We work a lot with science that's not in my view for a broader impact. And I think the biggest misconception is that you have to go in the I mean, there's an entire network of people um, who want to help you um, and want, want to do this stuff. But I think that was the key to the success of the students discover piece is it wasn't the consumer science was doing it, it was like in partnership with educators. And so that ends up extensive networking. Yeah, and I mean I think really that the institution is building in such a way as to do many more big things here. And so um but the if if you want, let the people in this room be a conduit to become part of the network of people doing these kinds of things, even if it's not this. Um, and Holly and Jason and Karen are all great people that I can obviously point out right in front of you. Uh, so individual projects for sure have, and we've done a little bit historically, but not a ton, but there's lots of scope there for great stuff. I mean, in the tree project is a good example of bringing that from the beginning all the way to the end. and. Um, uh, I think especially as we have teachers interfacing via phones, which that's in the tropics will disproportionately be the case if they're connecting, but there's a lot of possibility there in terms of cool apps um, and apps that link through handheld microscopes and do all kinds of things. Uh, and the Cal Academy is really interested in figuring out new ways to think about apps in the context of this kind of work. Um, and there are some good examples. Maybe fewer than, certainly fewer than one could imagine. I, I, I didn't catch your name, sorry. Jocelyn Pollock from the Kirby Academy. So we have Kirby Hawks. 
So the other question I have is, uh, do you have uh, sort of vetting procedures for, let's like, say, juniors or seniors to take? Like, because if you had, uh, if you had uh, older students in K-12 system who are dividing their own product projects, you might be able to get buy-in at the whole school level very quickly. A senior comes up with a great idea and the entire school is clicking down mm -hmm. on that. We, we, I don't know if anybody in the room does. We don't now, but what we do see is somebody will show up at, my, at somebody's door with a quiet knock if they have a project. Um, and that's not happened multiple times, but it's super informal, and I don't even know how they find us. Um, <laughs> but I always know because it's the quietest knock in the world. Uh, but it would be great to have something like that. You know, so. I think in general, if we have this staged sort of approach where you start just you're collecting data for these bigger projects, it's maybe it's something really simple, but you can build on that to develop some hypotheses, build on that to do your own project. And I actually think of the university version of that will be really amazing too, where the first year you do a project everybody does where you're doing some teeny part, you're collecting amps, you're IDing plants, but subsequent well, classes build on the data you collected there to do more intensive work. Um, I think it would be totally, it's totally feasible. It's just administratively difficult. And the K-12 version is sort of administratively difficult too because how do you create that conduit? But I mean, does anybody else have things they've seen work there? I think you're right there about, I mean, there's two kinds of ways to think about citizen science. And one is that with, with having a project that is aggregating examples and observations from so many people, that's where it's addressing questions that could be answered. And so it's, it's very, and so yes, within that context, you could have people also asking other questions and doing things that, yes, from the observations that they've left, they can address that. So it's very different to scale, it's just a different level. And so, yeah, it's great that. But that can look really different. And, and what that looks like at this large scale, I mean, it's like when I learned to cook, it's like, yeah, I just stir the batter. You know, but that's still part of the way it process my mom did it. Right? And so it's kind of like that with citizen science. You know, it might seem like, oh, they're, you know, they're not doing any of that. They're just talking their hands. But if it's communicated right and together, they're still part of this whole bigger process. And yes, it can also be that. And the other model there that we've talked about some is like Ligon Middle School, which is just down the road. Um, we've now had, where's Julia? How many teachers will we have had from Ligon? So of all but one or two of the science teachers at Ligon. All six grade and and so that's a context where there's enough buy-in that we could actually do school-wide projects that are pretty ambitious. And, and, and you know, that becomes a special cases model, but, but it's pretty special special cases for those kids. And so, I don't know, I mean, I think we'll have multiple things going on at the same time, but that's, that's something where people have really good ideas about it. I'm all ears, as are lots of people here. Other thoughts? Um, I, I propose that because people are going from all over here, that maybe people sort of just turn to the people around them and introduce themselves, and people can talk a little bit. I'm going to sit up here. People want to come up here, um, and, and so everybody can meet each other a little bit. Because people have come here with a common set of interests and very different backgrounds, and that might be a good way to meet and greet. And I think very few people know even half of the people here. So. I did it. I did it.